Good morning. Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about uh, for our lesson, we'll do a lab at a later date. But for uh, today's lesson, what we're going to be learning is proper setup and uh, protective equipment regarding MIG welding. Now, first off, let's begin with proper equipment or proper uh, attire. It's going to be a lot similar to what you guys saw with uh, stick welding, with leather jackets leather gauntlet gloves, and a welding helmet, properly shade 10. Now, uh, along with those uh, um, different equipment, in any case, you're going to want to wear long sleeves. Uh, this is going to be a style of welding. Well, it's going to have fewer sparks like it would be uh, than it would be with uh, 6010 or 6011 uh, uh, stick welding. Uh, you're still going to get a really bright flash and causing a flash burn on your skin, a lot similar to that of a sunburn. Uh, to prevent that from ever occurring, uh, you want to use something like uh, leather gauntlet gloves, long sleeves, and of course you'll have that uh, leather, leather jacket covering up the arms. Uh, never wear shorts when you're doing uh, MIG welding with the amount of uh, uh, spatter that you would get in some cases uh, with MIG welding. So uh, uh, pants is going to be preferable along with closed-toed shoe, closed shoes. Uh, now as far as the setup, beginning from the back of the machine, uh, proper pressure that you would want with the MIG welder is going to be uh, 20 PSI. If ever I want to increase my pressure, uh, the only time I ever want to go more than 20 is going to be uh, 25 PSI. And that's if I'm going to be working outside. Uh, in any case, if ever I'm going to be uh, uh, working in the shop, it's going to be set to 20. Now, what's going to be the difference? Well, if I were to have a higher pressure, uh, it doesn't make the weld look any prettier. In fact, what you're going to be doing is using more gas, setting a lower pressure, preferably 20 PSI. That's going to be your best case scenario when it comes to uh, MIG welding and uh, uh, more adequate use, more efficient use of uh, using your uh, CO2 with your uh, MIG welding. If ever you're going to be, again, if you're going to be welding outside, 25 PSI is going to be preferable, okay? That's where you're going to see this gauge right here. Uh, the second gauge, that is how much gas you have in the tank. Now, um, when it comes to shipment on uh, your, uh, your bottles for MIG welding, uh, you're going to see it right around the tw uh, 2,500, 2,000 PSI. Uh, if you start seeing it dip too low, you never want to get it too low. Uh, once I get right around, though, say 500, I, I, that, that's when I start disconnecting. I change the bottles. If you ever you have, wind up having uh, this go empty, change out the bottles. It's not good for the bottles to have it go empty. Uh, so have it at uh, still have some pressure left when you go to change out your bottles. Um, make sure proper connection. Uh, if you have a hose leading over to uh, the machine, never have it tied behind either the chain or the welder. Get it pinched between the bottle and the welder. What that does, it cuts off the supply of gas. Uh, make sure that you have no way of, uh, of blocking that hose leading to the machine. And here we have Our, uh, our wire, our spool of wire here, uh, think of this as the electrode towards uh, stick welding, okay? Except this stick uh, that you would use for welding is never ending, okay? It's a constant feed. I, I've had friends use the analogy of it being like, uh, like as if you were to use a hot glue gun. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, um, uh, a, a, a good analogy, but uh, uh, with this wire continually feeding. Um, yesterday we wound up having to change out the spool. In any case, what we wind up doing is we not only change out the empty spool for a full spool, but actually I am changing up my liner. And the liner, think of it as a uh, protective sleeve uh, where that wire is gonna be fed through our cable leading over to our workstation, okay? Um, so uh, we have in this box here our wire as well as our drive wheels 
uh, drive wheels allowing the wire to be fed through to the uh, liner and cable. Next portion of the lesson here is gonna be setup, okay? Now would be our uh, wire speed and our, uh, our voltage. Now, uh, when you go through, uh, every welder is gonna be different, okay? When it comes to our, uh, our, our Lincoln welder, uh, this Lincoln doesn't have a go by a number system uh, when it goes to uh, voltage. Uh, it goes by a letter system, uh, A, B, C, D, E, as far as F, and in some cases, G. Uh, what we're going to be doing in our cases here, uh, we have every single welder we have in the shop is an 035. Okay, I try to make it as simple as possible for students, uh, so we have nothing but an 035 uh, wire. And uh, in a lot of cases, when it comes to our practice, we're welding on a 316th inch metal. That's when it comes to our uh, uh, welding exercises, we're usually using that thickness of metal. So when I'm setting up the machine, it's just lining up the graph. I'm just going along this line here of the 035, go all the way over to where I see my 316ths, and I have my selection, okay? Now you have a gray box and a white box, which leads to my next point. Um, it all depends upon the type of gas that you have. If you look at this chart here, white box means it's a 75-25 mixture of argon gas and CO2. The gray box is 100% CO2. Now, what does that mean? Well, this difference in gas could depend upon the uh, amount of either heat or penetration when it comes to the metal. Uh, in our shop, we have a mixture of 75-25, well, it comes out a lot smoother, whereas the CO2, 100% CO2, gets a lot more penetration. However, that well does have, uh, tend to have a little bit more spatter compared to the mixture gases. Uh, so my point is, is that the shop has all bottles using the 7525 mixture. So we're gonna be looking at the white box. And if we were to look at back at our chart, our white box, 280 is gonna be our speed, and D is gonna be the voltage. So how do we go about setting it up? Well, very simple. Little dial. You can set this up to oh, right around that range of 280. And then setting up my arrow at, at D, and there's my proper voltage. Now, uh, much like our stick welders, the uh, on-off switch, just like a light switch. Flip it on, welder's running. And I can just turn it off when I'm done. Uh, also, one other thing when it comes to turning on the welder, uh, your bottles are going to be opened all the way. Uh, much like uh, when we were doing uh, oxy-fuel welding and cutting in the oxygen, the bottles are high pressured cylinders. We do not open this partially. We have to open this up all the way because of that high pressured gas. Um, along with the uh, proper setup, the cable, um, have it as lax as possible. Uh, a lot of students make that mistake of, you know, or, or uh, they tend to have their welder right next to them as they're doing their welding, okay? They, they like to set it up and immediately, it's right there if ever they need to make any adjustments. Um, give yourself plenty of room. This way, uh, your cable is going to be as uh, lax as possible. It could properly feed the, ro uh, the wire. What not to do, if you were to have this cable, if it has a loop, uh, what that tends to do is it causes restrictions for that wire to feed through the cable, uh, creating a more, uh, um, you hear it by sound, makes a lot more of a, um, think of it like a machine gun-like noise, a constant uh, rattling as it's feeding through that, uh, uh, that cable. Uh, that, that tends to cause some restriction. Keep that cable as uh, lax as possible, preferably, a uh, nice straight line if it does need to have a, a loop, if you're working a little bit closer to the machine, it's okay to have one big arch. Uh, that's perfectly fine as long as it's as lax as possible, not crossing over the cable is what we want to prevent. Um, 
but uh, as far as uh, uh, set up with that cable, um, that's what we were looking for, is having it as lax as possible. Then of course, uh, just like our stick welder, we have a ground. Uh, the ground uh, is, uh, you either have it attached to uh, a metal surface like our table here, or the project itself. Um, well, I've had students in the past, uh, they've had uh, uh, projects where they need to prop up the metal, and sometimes they may have either a fire brick, uh, maybe sometimes a, a block of wood, in order to get that proper height for uh, metal. Well, by having that brick or that wood, it would cut off that uh, circuit of electricity going from uh, the welder through the project, through the ground, and back to the welder. Well, if you have that deflection of a brick or a piece of wood, that's gonna cause that uh, arc to uh, be cut off. So make sure that you have complete connections between uh, where you're welding, the project, as well as the ground. It's gotta have that continual circuit and not cut off by something like a piece of brick or a piece of wood. So always have the ground attached. Uh, and of course, we've gone over this before. If ever, say I'm uh, uh, welding over here on uh, say some, some sort of bench and uh, my ground's all the way attached over here to this table. Of course, I'm not gonna have a complete arc because there's this buffer zone here. You have to have this ground connected to either the project you're working on or metal surface that is hooked up to the project that you are welding on. Uh, very plain and simple when it comes to uh, set up with this machine. Very, um, very easy to learn, but hard to perfect. It takes a lot of practice in order to get the uh, uh, proper arc pattern and consistency with this weld, but a lot of fun to get to practice and, uh, and get to work with. But uh, that would be, that would conclude our lesson of how to set up uh, proper, uh, proper setup when it comes to the uh, MIG welder.